Hi, today we are going to continue with the topic we started last lecture, uh, which is conservation and managing the environment. So today, what types of conservation initiatives have occurred over time? What are the underlying assumptions of these projects and policies? And what current directions has conservation taken? So some questions to keep in mind as we go. What is biodiversity? Um, and in short, it's all of the variation on this planet from the level of the genes in a fruit fly to entire marine ecosystems. Why does biodiversity need conserving? Um, in short, because it's decreasing and our survival as humans depends on it, like it or not. And third, what are the goals of biodiversity conservation? Um, so again, one argument for why conserving biodiversity is important is it's an essential part of the health and functioning of our planet that supports us, right? Um, it produces oxygen, it uptakes carbon dioxide, all these other processes we rely on for survival. Um, and so the goal to protect biodiversity, are we doing that? This is a picture of Yosemite National Park. Um, that's been protected in the name of conservation. Is this Yosemite, is this biodiversity conservation? Does this actually achieve the goals of conservation and sustainable management? So biodiversity, to define it for you, it broadly refers to the full set of species, the genetic variation within those species, and the variety of ecosystems that contain these different species, as well as the natural abundance in which these items occur. It's an important part of the overall health and sustainability of our environment, the life support system on which we depend. Uh, biodiversity is what creates nutrients, recycles waste. It provides all these resources that all life relies on for survival. Currently, we are in what has been termed an extinction crisis. Extinction rates are one way to measure biodiversity decline. Um, and currently, we're in the worst extinction since the extinction of the dinosaurs. So 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs went extinct, um, believed to be due to a large meteor that hit the earth somewhere around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and essentially, this triggered a nuclear winter. Um, wildfires, it blotted out the sky with smoke um, killed off the vegetation also via nuclear winter and when all the vegetation died all the herbivorous dinosaurs subsisting on that vegetation died the carnivorous dinosaurs eating those herbivores then died um, and so evolution and how fit a species is is always relative to the environment they have it and biological evolution moves at a glacial pace it can't keep pace with rapid environmental change um, and so it's sort of concerning that we're in a current extinction crisis um, similar to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Over the past century, the last hundred years, extinction rates have ranged anywhere from 100 to 10,000 times the typical rate per year that we've seen from a long term perspective. Um, so if you go back into the paleontological record long before human species even existed, the average extinction rate on Earth is anywhere from one to 10 species per year. That's what we can tell from the paleontological record. Um, and so now what we're saying is that rate is anywhere from 100 to 10,000 times higher each year than it has been in the past. Um, if you look at the graph on the bottom right corner, global biodiversity, that's from 1750, Industrial Revolution, up till 2000, and you can see an exponential increase in species extinction rates. That extinction rate, note the vertical axis, that's species extinctions in the thousands. So you're seeing up to 20,000 extinctions um, per year at some, some points, depending on, again, um, the circumstances of that year. This data, by the way, comes from uh, the UN. It's 2010, the source, the Global Biodiversity Outlooks on the bottom if you're interested in looking into any of it. Um, if current trends continue, between one third to two thirds of all the species on the planet will disappear um, sometime possibly by the middle of this century. 
um, again, if, if trends continue. Um, a couple other things from the report, it also has confirmed that we have failed to reduce biodiversity loss, at least by 2010. And I can tell you the picture hasn't changed much since then. And it also warns us that these losses might be irreversible if we re reach these tipping points, right? When you start changing tree cover and landscapes, that affects climate, rainfall, temperature, um, and in, in turn affects overall habitats and the species that live in them. Um, so for example, in the Amazon, right? Large areas of the Amazon forests are dying uh, due to climate change, also deforestation and fires, um, logging companies. And so this loss of forest has further contributed to global climate change because you're taking away a major carbon sink. It's also created regional rainfall changes in the area and resulted in widespread spread species extinctions there. Um, another example, there's also been multiple collapses of coral reef ecosystems. And again, all these ecosystems the species that are within them rely on them, right? When the ecosystem goes, so does the biodiversity it contains. Um, multiple co coral reef collapses due to a combination of different anthropogenic causes, um, ocean acidification from increasing CO2 emissions makes the water more acidic as it absorbs the carbon, um, warmer water overall leading to bleaching of corals, also overfishing and nutrient pollution, right? This eutrophication, uh, nutrient influx from our fertilizer and our chemicals that we use for agriculture and other things that goes into our freshwater and marine ecosystems. And when this eutrophication occurs, this nutrient influx, you get what's called a toxic algae bloom. Um, the phytoplankton algae populations explode because they have all these nutrients all of a sudden. The, that's great for the plankton, but it kills literally everything else in that marine ecosystem because it chokes out all the oxygen out of the water. Um, and so the, the collapse of coral reef systems, this is impacting hundreds of millions of species that are directly dependent on coral reefs. Um, they're some of the most bio biodiverse ecosystems in the world. Um, the charts on the top, just to show you, again, ecosystem and habitat loss, which again contributes to species extinction. This shows the last 40 years or so from 1970 to 2010, starting on the top left, um, that's live coral reef ecosystems. They've declined um, from 10 to 30 percent in the last few decades. Uh, on the top right, that's forest extent, which has also declined. On the bottom left, mangrove extent. Um, mangroves, for those of you that don't know, mangrove can refer to a specific type of tree, but it can also refer to a type of ecosystem where mangrove trees grow. And the mangrove is sort of an area um, between the, the beach, the coast, and the reef break. Uh, and so it's sort of the shallow um, tide pool area inside the break, so not out in the open ocean, and inside these areas and these mangroves, uh, mangrove trees grow. And the two things that are really important about these areas is the waters are very calm. Again, it's inside the reef break. And there's also no large predatory species in mangroves. So mangroves are a really important area for species reproduction, for spawning. Fish and other animals come here to spawn and reproduce. Um, we see mangrove extent also decreasing. That has an effect not only on the species living there, but also reproductive rates. Um, and then that last graph, the bottom right, that's seagrass extent, which is also declining. And so some cases uh, are worse than others, but overall what we're seeing is a decrease in biodiversity. Um, and one major con contribution of that is habitat loss. Another thing about biodiversity is it's strongly patterned where it occurs. The greatest storehouse of areas that are biodiverse tend to be warm and humid. These are this is where we find the most biodiversity. Um, so especially tropical rainforests like the Amazon and also tropical marine environments like Hawaii or Solomon Island cor coral reef systems, um, Fiji, etc. And just seven percent, less than a tenth of the Earth's surface, is thought to contain at least half of the world's species, at least 50% of the world's diversity. Um, so it's strongly patterned in specific places. 80% of biodiversity hotspots are also found in developing countries. So hotspots are regions that are extremely biodiverse, which is defined by high species endemism. So there's a large amount of species that occur naturally there. Um, the rule of thumb is the area has to contain at least 0.5% 
of the world's 300,000 plant species. So it has to have at least 1,500 different plant species um, that endemically occur there naturally, which also means once they're gone, once that ecosystem is gone, all those species are gone elsewhere. They don't occur in other places. So high endemism and hotspots are also defined by being under a high degree of threat, um, meaning they've lost a certain amount of their original extent. Um, Specifically, in this case, they have to have lost more than 70% of their primary or original vegetation. And so you can see on the map, there's extreme overlap between biodiversity hotspots and the developing world. This is where we find them. Um, most diversity is in a, a small handful of pockets. The map identifies sort of 36 main areas that support roughly 60% of the world's plant and animal populations right, that are endemic in these areas. And importantly, most population growth in the future is going to be in these areas with the highest biodiversity. Um, so why does biodiversity need conserving? Um, because there's gonna be an inevitable increase in the amount of human environment interaction in the future. Um, but the good news is we can shape what that looks like. Um, so if you look at the charts on the, on the slide, the first one on the left just shows world population growth, um, 1950 projected onto 2050, and actually pretty accurate um, taking our current population in year. And so um, it's just a projection, but again, it shows not really much population growth going on in the developed world. Um, it's the developing world where population growth is occurring, not just in general, but this is also true of urban population growth. On the right shows the 12 biggest cities in 1975. And if you note, many of them are in the developed world, Tokyo, um, New York, not all of them, right? Mexico City, Sao Paulo, um, but Paris, Moscow. By 2025, the biggest cities are going to be some still in the developing world, but many of them now in the, or excuse me, some still in the developed world, but many now in the developing world as well, right? Delhi, Mumbai, um, Dhaka, Lagos. And so we're, what we're seeing is most population growth is going to be in the developing world um, and especially urban population growth. And why? Why is this? Why are we seeing so much urban population growth in the developing world? Well, one reason for this is so many people in the developing world have been disenfranchised from their land, from their subsistence base, from their traditional livelihood. Um, they've lost their lands to more powerful groups and they can no longer pursue their traditional livelihoods. Um, via colonialism and missionization and neo-capitalism through the global free market, um, completely unregulated capitalism, these people have literally uh, lost their lands, the, the, the very foundation on which they have traditionally lived. Um, and so you're seeing urban migration as people leave their traditional homelands in search of wage work to provide, eke out some sort of, sort of living to support themselves and their family. Um, so this is what, where most biodiversity occurs and also where most population growth is going to be occurring in the future. So the big question, uh, why conserve biodiversity? And there's two basic views in the conservation literature, what people, scientists, scholars have said about this. Two views on how to value biodiversity. Uh, first, the intrinsic or inherent value of biodiversity. And secondly, the utilitarian or instrumental value of biodiversity. And so the intrinsic view is one you're probably already familiar with. Um, especially those of you, if it, if it upset you when I said styrofoam is the same as the Amazon, you're probably familiar with this view of nature. Um, the intrinsic view is labeled as biocentric, meaning the focus is on the bio, the biology, the flora, the fauna, the biodiversity found in environments. It's on nature, the plants, the animals, and protecting that. Sort of nature for nature's sake. Biocentric focus. The utilitarian approach is usually labeled as human-centered. And the idea here, in contrast to the intrinsic view, conserve biodiversity for the goods, the services, the uses that it brings to humans. Conserve nature because we rely on it. We need it. And, and like it or not, our lives are predicated on the need for these resources. Um, maybe not as many as we use, but at least some. And so are other species. Um, our species is kind of unique and we seem to be the only ones destroying our environments we depend on on a large scale. Um, again, this isn't a natural human trait. This is a culturally specific trait. Humans have lived sustainably in their environments 
all over the place um, throughout many different time periods, um, as anthropology shows us. So let's talk in more detail about the intrinsic view. Um, and, and intrinsic meaning that um, the, the trees, the plants, the animals, they have intrinsic inherent value. They have value simply because they exist kind of like humans, right? How a, a positive way to view humanity, especially for any of you that have ventured into psychology or, or therapy even, um, humans have value, right? Just because. And so that's sort of the idea here. They view nature as something that has inherent rights, just like humans have rights. Um, nature has rights too, in, um, in their own right. And so they argue that um, species and the environment, nature, the flora, the fauna, should be subject to the same moral, ethical, and legal protections as humans. Um, uh, examples of this sort of viewpoint um, are shown in eco-philosophies such as spiritual ecology or deep ecology. Uh, spiritual ecology, sort of this mystical attitude towards nature that emphasizes this deep unity people have with the land and the animals. Sort of, we're all connected. We're all part of a continuum. Your actions have re effects on others, right? If they don't exist in a vacuum, we're all sort of in interconnected. And we should have some reverence and awe for that, if you will. So as an example of this sort of viewpoint, we're going to watch a quick clip of someone talking about deep ecology. So go ahead and pause the lecture and then you can watch this clip one of two ways. It's less than three minutes. You can either type the link into your browser and watch it, or I've also included the link in the description for this YouTube video. So just look in the description for the video lecture you're watching right now. You can copy and paste the link right from there, pop it into your browser. Um, so go ahead, watch that. It's less than three minutes. It's a good example of deep ecology and how these folks view nature and the environment. Um, so go ahead, pause the lecture, watch that, and then come back. Okay, so hopefully you watched the video clip. And so that's sort of in line with this, uh, this intrinsic view. Conserve nature because of its inherent value, because other organisms have inherent rights, if you will. In contrast, the utilitarian or instrumental view or value for biodiversity. Uh, this says conserve it because we rely on it in many ways. Again, like it or not, we do. And so there's sort of four categories they tease apart to show ways in which we rely on need biodiversity. Um, this includes goods. The environment provides food for us through plants and animals and the soil, um, fuel through wood and other means, um, medicine through plants, uh, construction materials, all, si all sorts of types of resources. Um, the environment also provides services for us that keep us alive, the ecosystem services that we rely on, um, pollination, nitrogen fixation, recycling of nutrients back into the soil, oxygen production of plants, as well as carbon dioxide uptake, uh, waste composition, decomposition, excuse me, all these different services that keep things going. Nature or the environment, biodiversity also provides lots of information we can draw upon. Um, for example, genetic engineering, there's lots of genetic diversity found in nature that we can use to create medicine, um, to create genetically modified organisms. And remember, GMOs aren't necessarily an evil thing. It's, it depends on how they get used, right? What are they being used for? There's lots of um, potential positive uses for them, also potential negative ones. Um, applied biology, right? Use biological and ecological principles found in nature and then apply that towards solving human and environmental problems. We sort of looked at an example of this when we talked about agroforestry, right? Using ecological principles found in nature and then applying that to farming systems. And then uh, fourth, this the psycho-spiritual reasons. Um, we use nature, we like it for recreation, for tourism, for its aesthetic beauty. Um, this idea of biophilia, these strong bonds humans feel with nature. We have awe for it, we love for it, reverence for it, it brings us joy. Um, and I usually, if we were talking as a class, you know, does anyone disagree? Does anyone hate nature? I mean, most of us know, yeah, there's something to that. 
Um, like when I asked you to define nature, none of us really had the same definition, but there are a lot of similarities, right? There is something to that. And so the utilitarian view argues that the key to conservation and getting people on board with it is nature's monetary value uh, rather than its intrinsic value. And uh, many people don't like the way that feels, that makes them feel. Um, what do you mean we are saving nature because we need it rather than we care about it? Um, so kind of stick with the lecture and hopefully we'll, we'll tease out why that is over the next few days if you haven't already started to figure that out. And so the argument here is a sign of value to things, to conservation, to resources, to specific environments a sign of value and people in this globalized world will begin to have a reason to preserve it. It doesn't have to be extractive use. It could also be money generated by ecotourism. So like protect this environment so people can come visit it. That'll bring in ecotourism money for the community. How that actually plays out in real life is another question, um, which we'll, we'll actually be getting into. Um, but give, give it a value, give people an incentive, a reason to conserve it. Um, you know, unfortunately, for many, uh, the, the long-term sustainability and ecology doesn't really pull on everyone's heartstrings for whatever reasons, whether that's lack of education or understanding or science denial um, or, or whatever. Maybe people just don't care. That's fine um, for them. But so now you'll hear um, others talking about climate change in terms of economic costs. And the goal here is if people don't care about the environment. At least we can get them to care about their fucking wallet. Right. So put a price tag on it. Show people the money they're saving. Um, another argument for giving biodiversity a value um, so that we can actually achieve conservation, give people a reason to care. Um, giving biodiversity a value, the utilitarian view. So 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 do this either to conserve it for ecotourism or protect it so you can extract sustainably from it. Um, it gives us a basis to defend against other types of economic development, right? Like other outsiders coming in like Dole or Coca-Cola that want to do their own projects that are probably definitely not going to benefit the community um, the way they're going to be using that environment. And so the example on the slide um, ha is about assigning economic value to coral reef ecosystems. And so it's tough to put a dollar value on the benefits of coral ecosystems because many of them are indirect, right? Um, according to this source on the slide, one recent estimate gave the total net benefit of the world's coral reef systems to be about 30 billion per year. Um, so they, they use Hawaii as an example. They say, if you look at Hawaii's coral reefs and you combine money from recreational use, um, amenity use, fisheries, and also biodiversity values, like, and this is part of the indirect part, you know, ecosystem services, um, the overall health of the ecosystem, the biodiversity, that in itself brings value through creating a productive environment uh, for other reasons. So it's tough to sort of actually figure out an exact value, but one estimate said the reefs in Hawaii direct economic benefit of 360 million per year. Um, so again, the idea is let uh, sh find a way to show people the value in not destroying these resources and areas um, so that we can conserve, achieve conservation. Um, and then the graph breaks down just the component values of that. If you're interested, the sources on the slide. Um, it's just an example of what these folks are, are talking about. Um, and so, so in the utilitarian view of conservation, again, it's, it's similar to when we talked about how sustainability might have to be assigned a monetary value. Remember when we were talking about carbon credits, this idea of charging people for how much uh, CO2 they emit or how much pollution? So that the idea is it becomes more profitable to, to be less polluting. Um, tax people for being polluters and it'll change the incentives. It'll become more profitable to be less polluting. Um, we got to get the incentives right. So again, if non-conservation is more lucrative than conservation, what do you think businesses will choose? And this is one of the arguments behind the utilitarian view. Um, both, both approaches, intrinsic and utilitarian, have problems. Um, so problems with the utilitarian view. Remember the intrinsic values nature just because. And so it would say anything and everything. Except for the humans, right? They're the problem. Get them out. Um, so in the utilitarian view, what if a species or a natural 
ecosystem process, like a certain fish or bug or flower um, or an animal, has no value to humans. Um, we don't use it or rely on it uh, for anything. Or, or also, what if the species is dangerous to humans? So like not killing it or um, not doing anything poses a major threat to human settlement. So look on the slide. Here's a picture, the map of the distribution of grizzly bears in the U.S. and California. And all the colors combined to show post-glacial distribution, so several thousand years ago. Um, the, the darker, ugly, shit brown colors. So everything minus the light tan, that's historic distribution. And then present distribution is just that darkest brown color on the slide. Um, we've essentially eradicated grizzly bears out of California, right? This is the only grizzly left in California. It's the, it's the one on our fucking flag. Um, and so the intrinsic view would, would have saved the grizzly bears, save nature for nature's sake. The utilitarian, no, right? Um, it's dangerous to humans. We have to protect people too. Um, so the intrinsic would save it. But what about the people in that area? Um, Californians, right? What about the people in California that's now been turned into a reserve to protect grizzlies? In the US, we killed the grizzlies. Yet we go over to Africa and arrest them for defending their own homes and lives and gardens from large, large species there that are dangerous to them, like elephants, for example. Um, and so which view do you sort of agree with um, and why? And keep in mind, um, even if you sort of fall on the intrinsic side, and don't get me wrong, I do too, but it, it's a, this is about getting practical results, right? If we're doing conservation, but it's not actually conserving anything, then what's the fucking point? Um, and so this is, a, this is really important. We killed all the grizzly bears here. Um, okay, so what do you do? Maybe save it. Okay. What if it threatens your family? Put it on a reserve. Okay, what about the people that used to live on that land? Um, this is exactly what we did in Africa. We wanted to go over there and save big charismatic megafauna for our own enjoyment, um, lions and elephants and etc. But in the process, we kicked locals off their land. Um, so it's okay to kill large predators here, but not in Africa, right? Um, I hopefully you're starting to see some of the problems with the assumptions in Western conservation and the projects that we've implemented and imposed on other people. And if you take nothing else away, realize these issues are complex. People that offer simple solutions like build a fence between us and them or between the people and the wildlife um, to keep the people out, these, these offer no solutions at all. And so let's talk for a moment about the changing practice of conservation. In the, um, conservation initiatives have gone through different phases throughout time, and the different phases reflect our thinking and also our understanding about the relationship between the environment and humans. And so the first phase of conservation was strict protectionism, this idea of strict protectionism of nature, protect the, the nature, keep the people out. And this led to the rise of national parks in the U.S., um, this protectionism, fines and fences type model, keep the people out, is also known as the Yellowstone model. Um, it was inspired by George Catlin, an American frontier artist. And so uh, the Yellowstone model, national parks are defined by the following. Settlement is prohibited, so people can't live within the boundaries, and both subsistence and also commercial resource use are banned. Um, again, it's based off this strict nature protection idea and the idea that humans aren't part of wild landscapes and therefore must be kept separate. And so Catlin argued that the U.S.'s natural heritage should be saved by some great protecting policy of government in a magnificent park containing all the wild and freshness of nature's beauty. And Catlin's vision, or part of it at least, became a reality. Um, and it resulted in the parks protection and preservation paradigm. Uh, in 1872, Yellowstone National Park was established in Wyoming, um, then Acadia in Maine, and then Yosemite was established. 
One major aspect of Catlin's vision was left out, and part of why he wanted to establish the parks was to protect Native Americans, uh, their lives, their culture, their way of life. That didn't happen. Native Americans were evicted from Yellowstone in addition to many other U.S. parks, um, mostly by relocating them to reservations or worse. And this, the establishment of national parks via the removal of the people that lived within them, this is what has led to this popular perception of parks, of nature, as these empty, pristine areas free from human influence. And it's so far from the reality. And so this idea of conservation has come to equal this notion of protecting wilderness. And it's based off this flawed assumption about what wilderness and nature is and about it being separate from humans. Um, and there's been a lot of negative consequences for the people that lived in these wildernesses. Sorry about that, my phone ring. So U.S. parks were established to protect spectacular scenery. Again, the parks reflect the preservation and protection paradigm. Um, and this falls within the intrinsic value of biodiversity. Protect nature for nature's sake. It's bio rather than human centric. Um, and the Yellow Mo Yellowstone model was established here and then adopted and exported around the world. The rise of national parks occurred concurrently with the rise of something else called resource management. Um, this also known as the rise of national forest designation. So recall from Ben Orlove um, about Lake Titicaca, he talks about the difference between a national park and a national reserve. And both are types of protected areas, but there's different types of protected areas that have different statuses um, or designed for different purposes or uses. And so the difference between a park and a reserve is resource extraction. It's allowed in the reserve. That's actually why reserves are designed, what they're designed for, whereas resource extraction is not allowed in a park. Um, so again, parks, strict nature protectionism, um, reserves rise with resource management. Um, for example, 19, or excuse me, 1891, the Forest Reserve Act was established by the US government. Um, it's a state property regime, and they set aside 13 million acres of forest. Um, and the, these were established, the National Forest, to enhance the quantity and quality of timber production. So the purpose of them was to set them aside to continue sus harvesting sustainably from them. Uh, and national reserves, unlike parks, fall under the utilitarian view of biodiversity. So in the sense that we're, we're conserving, preserving these areas in order to continue to extract sustainably versus parks where um, resource use settlement is not allowed, strict protection of them. So these two paradigms, national parks, strict nature protectionism based on the intrinsic value versus national forests, um, reserves, extractive use, but sustainable based in the utilitarian vein, they remained separate um, up until the 1920s when uh, the Hetch Hetchy controversy happened. And so the big question was, should a valley in Yosemite National Park be flooded to provide water for San Francisco? This is the valley of Hetch Hetchy here pictured on the slide. And no, see the river, the landscape, there's plants and animals that live in there. In 1906, there was a major earthquake that devastated San Francisco. And it also, following the earthquake, there was a huge fire. And so it made the inadequacy of San Francisco's water system pretty clear. The city then applied to the United States Department of the Interior to try to get water rights to Hetch Hetchy. So remember, since uh, Hetch Hetchy falls under a national park designation, it's regulated and managed by the government, the state, it's nationally regulated. And so an act of Congress was needed to allow people to use the water from it. Um, in th this is exactly what happened. Um, there was a 13 battle over doing this. And in 1913, Congress, along with President Woodrow Wilson, signed the Raker Act. Um, this permitted the flooding of the valley. 
um, and the dam that allowed the valley to be flooded was eventually built in 1923. But the deal was, um, the only reason California was allowed to do this, the deal was that the, the power and the water that was derived from the river and the dam built here um, had to be used for public interest. Now, ultimately, this didn't happen. The city failed to keep their promise, and they sell hydropower from the dam to PG&E still today. Um, and you can see this is what the valley looks like now after the dam was built. Um, it now delivers water about 170 miles west to San Francisco in the Bay Area. And this, this is still controversial today um, on legal and environmental platforms. And again, it's kind of interesting, you know, oh, we need water. And so we turned our national park into a, a flooded valley. Um, but save the elephants, kick the Africans out of their land. Don't touch that. And so the 1950s and 60s um, saw this increasing fear of worldwide ecological destruction. Um, this is sort of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, DDT, we're pumping chemicals into our environment, birds are dying, wildlife's dying, people are being poisoned. And so awareness really gets raised at this time. Um, and the result is it led to these highly preservationist policies following in the Yellowstone model. And so the goal was comprehensive biodiversity protection, right? Protect the environment. Um, whether this was actually achieved is another question. Um, and this is when we see the emergence of these international NGOs. Um, it's an era of coercive conservation. People are being kicked off their land in the, in the name of nature. Um, international non-government organizations start to emerge that are focused on this. Um, the World Wildlife Fund in 1961. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is another big one established in 1951. And these organizations and efforts have been successful in protecting charismatic megafauna, right? Elephants, panda, lions, all the animals that we fucking fall in love with, that we watch BBC David Attenborough documentaries about. Um, does protecting elephants and a handful of large charismatic megafauna does this actually conserve biodiversity? Does this achieve the goals of conservation? And the answer is not necessarily. Um, this is not really conserving biodiversity. Other than avoiding threats to a couple of species or the extinction of a couple of species, these efforts are really doing very little for conservation and very little for creating sustainable human, human environment interactions in the long run. Um, why are we saving fucking elephants and not the Delta smelt? Who knows who the, what the Delta smelt is? It's this tiny, stupid, sorry if you like it, a slimy little fish that is endemic to the San Joaquin um, Sacramento estuaries that helps. Uh, this is where we withdraw agricultural water for farming in California. The Delta smelt has gone pretty much extinct in nature because of all the water we're pulling out. Um, and some other things. We'll, we'll talk about it actually later on in the class. The Delta smelt is way more important to the overall functioning of the ecosystem in the Bay Area than elephants are. Way more important. It's a, it's a cornerstone species. Um, other species rely on it. Um, the smelt going away can alter the entire ecology of these regions. So why are we saving elephants and not the Delta smelt? Right? Because people don't fall in love with the Delta smelt. You don't get mailed a picture of a Delta smelt and write them a hundred dollar check like you do when someone sends you a picture of a panda or a fucking elephant. Don't get me wrong. I love elephants. My fiance is hopefully napping in the other room. He'd be crying right now. He loves elephants. So do I. This is my point. Okay, we talk, We killed all the grizzlies here, but don't touch the elephants. The grizzlies are dangerous to us, threaten us. We also kill coyotes when they kill our farm animals or threaten our pets, but don't touch the elephants. Elephants require over a thousand square miles of woodlands to forage and feed. Um, the result is that they can destroy entire ecosystems through traveling that support thousands of other species. They also destroy human settlements. They also crop raid people's gardens. Do we let wild animals eat all of our food? Right? No, we don't. Um, so save the elephants, but screw the fucking people. Right? We'll kick the Africans off their land to save the elephants, yet we killed 
every single grizzly in California except for the one on the flat to make room for people. So again, don't get me wrong, I love elephants. Um, but are, by saving elephants, a couple of charismatic megafauna, are we actually achieving the goals of conservation, which is protecting biodiversity? Um, we'll keep talking about that. And another um, ramification of this protectionist, preservationist national park paradigm is many local communities were excluded from the process entirely um, and, and quite frankly, just removed from their lands. The national park concept is based off coercive conservation um, and the premise that nature must be preserved free from human influence. Um, and the result is a lot of communities have been removed from their land. Less powerful groups, indigenous people especially, right? People are the problem. It's not Californians getting kicked off of the grizzly reserve in California. It's the coon getting kicked off the Kalahari game reserve. Um, examples, the Maasai, a pastoral group in Africa, Maasai cattle herders were excluded from the preserves on the Serengeti Plains. You know, actually, the, the very ecology of the Serengeti Plains and the large scale animal migrations that take place are in part created from anthropogenic activities, specifically cattle herders burning bush brush to get rid of the tsetse fly, which um, plagues their cattle. And this freed up migration patterns for other large scale animals. So Maasai kicked out to save the Serengeti. Um, the Kung or son of the Kalahari were kicked out of the central Kalahari game reserve. Miwok were forced out of Yosemite by the US Army. Um, Yosemite was the world's first wilderness park. And the Shoshone were expelled from Yellowstone. Um, with national parks, what was once traditional settlement for thousands and tens of thousands of years for indigenous and small scale groups is now deemed illegal squatting, get out. Um, and traditional hunting and resource use, these people have been subsisting in these environments for generations, is now illegal poaching. And we'll arrest you if you try to feed your family in the way you traditionally have. Um, pictured on the slide is from the myth of wild Africa. These men and their children were arrested for hunting illegally in Nika National Park, Malawi. Um, these, these people are the problem, right? They're the problem with the environment and why we can't achieve sustainability. I just want to say one more thing about elephants real quick, um, which won't be the last time. One other thing about elephants, uh, I forgot to mention on the last slide, there was a, a Green Love talk years ago, and this guy, Lynn, um, he had been in the army or so, he'd done a lot of travel, he was an older white male, and he told this story to the students about um, this a sad story about when he was a kid, he remembered um, all these elephants being killed um, in Africa. They were being shot with machine guns from helicopters. And this actually happened. You can look into it. And so he was saying how sad and disgusting this is and da, da, da. And so he's dedicated his life to saving the elephants and blah, blah, blah. Um, what Lynn failed to explain to his audience was the reason why those elephants, that elephant population had exploded and therefore needed to be culled. And what had happened is several generations prior to this time period, he pointed out, outsiders came in and instituted conservation policies, save the elephants, and they would, that's exactly what they did. Don't touch the elephants, um, fuck the people. And what happened is, um, without any check on the elephant population, it ac absolutely exploded. Um, exponential population growth to where um, elephants were just destroying everything else they were around because there were so many of them. So because of conservation efforts and intervening by outsiders in the name of nature, that is why decades later, people had to shoot elephants from helicopters with machine guns because of white Western conservationists in the first place that created that situation, right? Um, it's the less powerful groups that suffer, right? Can you imagine the Kung, the people pictured on the slide coming over 
here. I don't know if that's necessarily the coon. Um, coming over here and arresting us for shooting a grizzly bear that um, attacked our sort of home or endangered us, or for farmers um, shooting a, at a coyote that ate their animals or their pets or endangered their small children. Can you imagine the coon coming over and putting us in jail for what we do um, to survive? No. And but that is literally what we did in the reverse in Africa. Right. Again, don't get me wrong. I love elephants. But are we actually conserving biodiversity? Are we creating sustainability? And about 50 to 100 years of these failed policies would suggest not necessarily. Um, the rise of protected areas, which again includes parks, reserves, and other types of PAs is on the rise. Uh, this shows 1872 to 2008. Um, and it even excludes PAs with unknown years of establishment. So the number is actually probably a bit higher. It's terrestrial, marine, and also total protected areas. The growth of protected areas has been problematic. Um, a couple of reasons in addition to the things I've been talking about. First, many protected areas, these PAs, these parks, aren't actually sites of high biological diversity, right? It might be beautiful like Yosemite or some other place, but it doesn't actually conserve a significant percentage of biodiversity. Um, so we might be spending a ton of money excluding resource users from the area, uh, even though the protected area does very little for biodiversity conservation. Another problem is scientific evidence has showed islands of protected areas haven't been very effective. So if you sort of protect sections of land, but you're not actually protecting entire ecosystems or entire migration patterns, you're not really protecting anything. Other problems, um, something called paper parks. These are, are protected areas that have been established. They're, they exist on paper. They might receive funding or recognition or even an award for their efforts, but they are not actually managed or regulated in any real way on the ground. They exist on paper and in no other way, and thus they do nothing for conservation. And the, hu the rights, human rights of the local people that live in these, used to live in these protected areas, have been absolutely trampled. So since the 1980s, and this is where we're headed, strict protectionism has been replaced by something called community-based conservation. And so you've been reading about from Orla something called community-based resource management, um, which is an alternative to state or private regulation of resources. Uh, Community-based conservation is an alternative to these top-down, outsider-imposed conservation policies that we've been discussing. Um, and it's conservation that recognizes the rights as well as the value in including the local community, the actual local resource users whose livelihoods depend on those resources. Um, Community-based conservation reflects a shift to the utilitarian view of biodiversity. Um, are we conserving it for nature's sake or because like it or not, we, we need it, we rely on it, we live within it. And so environmental protection under this vein is now coupled with social justice, with alleviating poverty, building local capacity, and also instilling social justice. You cannot, if you want to achieve environmental justice, sustainability, you never will unless you achieve social justice. Um, it's, there's no two ways about it. You cannot ask um, poor villager in Somali or wherever we're talking about to not go cut down that little measly tree on their fucking land that at least used to be. Don't go cut down that tree to sell a little bit of firewood in the market to buy a little bit of rice to maybe feed you and your kids for a day. Don't, ch don't chop down that tree because conservation. We we will never achieve conservation or environmental justice without coupling it with social justice. You cannot ask people to, to willingly die by not using their resources. It's, not, it's just not gonna happen, okay? We need to achieve both. We need more equality. We need to reduce poverty. Um, give people a reason to care about those resources, right? If they're not allowed to use them, if they can't subsist on them and they have no other option, there is no reason to respect those boundaries. What would you do? How would you fucking feel? 
Okay, so uh, this is more human-centered conservation. And I know the word probably bothers you because when we talk about conservation, we're not usually talking about people. But remember, this isn't just Western culture. This is all people, small-scale indigenous societies, natives. Um, it's not just about the flora and the fauna. There's people that have long lived in these environments too. And so in CBC, um, another thing is it involves co-management. It's not just some sort of top-down outsider controlled project. Um, Decision-making and participation involves conservation experts, but also the local community. Um, all stakeholders are sort of involved. Um, this decentralized control. And so it sounds good, community-based conservation. It's one of, like uh, the Green Love talked the other day about greenwashing. We use these buzzwords, participatory, community-based, sustainable, fair trade. Um, does it really mean that it's that? Um, and in many cases, you have to actually look into the project or the company to find out if they're actually doing that kind of stuff. Um, with that said, successful examples of community-based conservation definitely exist. Um, they are not without their problems, though. And so what we're going to be doing is you're going to be watching a film for the next lecture called Milking the Rhino. Uh, it's an awesome film. Uh, I've got Yes, Yes, You to pay like 250 bucks to buy it. And now that we're online, they just spent more money to get us access to it again. Um, so it's one of my favorite films that I show in all my classes. And I think you all will really get something out of it, too. Um, and so the way I have it set up is this is this is it for this lecture. And then this is lecture 20 and then lecture 21 is going to be the film. It's just a couple of slides with instructions on how to access the film. And you can watch it anytime between now and before you watch the lecture that will be posted for Tuesday, lecture 22. Um, the film goes sort of in between this lecture and the next. It won't be on your quiz for this Sunday, the film. Um, it will be on the following quiz, quiz seven and also exam three. So it's about an, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, watch it when you want. Just make sure you watch it before you um, before you view the next lecture that I post next week. You want to watch this film first because the next lecture follows from it. And when you watch the film, um, again, lecture 21, which I'll have posted for you on Blackboard, there's very explicit instructions on how to access the film and watch it through the SDSU library. And so there's three questions I want you to sort of keep in mind and, and answer while you're watching the film. Um, one, what is the meaning of the title, Milking the Rhino? Think, think about it. And the answer to that will sort of come to you throughout the film. What's the meaning of that, Milking the Rhino? Second, who benefits from the protected area in CBC? Um, does the community or do the outsiders? Is it equal or unequal? How are the benefits distributed? And just a hint for this one, um, they're not going to explicitly say this maybe, but there's lots of examples of how the benefits get distributed. There's sort of two case studies in the film. Um, and so there's different examples of how this plays out. Jot down, take notes. And then third, if protected areas are only possible through utilization, I mean, giving people a reason to respect them, um, not disenfranchising them from them, aren't the protected areas at risk because the resources are allowed to be harvested. And so sort of this is for you to think about sort of pros and potential cons of the utilitarian approach. If people are allowed to use it, doesn't that leave it vulnerable to not actually being conserved? Um, so again, this, that's it for this lecture. Um, the next thing you're gonna do is watch this film. You'll pull up lecture 21 sometime over the weekend, um, sometime between now and before you watch Tuesday's lecture. Um, and it's really good. I think that you'll definitely like it. All right, have a good one. Until next time.